Good morning, Ottawa Bible Church. How y'all doing this morning? That's, that's become a glorious sound, synonymous with hallelujah, so thank you. Um, hey, if you're also listening to us on air somewhere else in the community this morning, thank you so much. I want to make a few uh, brief announcements. Number one, today is mine and Shannon's sixth wedding anniversary. So, uh, to, to my permanent girlfriend out there, Shannon, I love you so much. Um, thank you so much for spending and putting up with me these last six years. Uh, also, just have a friend named Alyssa. Uh, she's 11 years old. She listens to KOFO every Sunday morning. Just wanted to say thank you for your faithful listening, Alyssa. And I also just wanted to take note uh, of tomorrow being Memorial Day. It being the day where we recognize those who have fallen and those who have fought for our freedom. So just to make a brief mention of that, thank you, Lord, for giving us faithful men who will defend this country. Amen, church. Let us jump into prayer, and then we're going to start with today's sermon. There's much that's heavy on my heart this morning, by the way. Uh, it's, believe it or not, not just formulaic to come up with a sermon as if you were going to a vending machine. This last week, I've been praying through, God, where, where exactly would you necessarily want me to preach? And there's this part of me that has this invitation to go back into chapter 3 just for a little bit, and then to transition into chapter 4 today. So we're, we will see where we end. I do just want to let you know that next week we will be finishing up the book of Ruth as well. And then for the summer months of June, July, and August, we're going to be jumping into the book of Daniel. That should be a fun endeavor for all of us. Let's pray. Bow your head, bow your heart. Let's ask that the Holy Spirit would have His way, and we'll begin with today's service. Jesus, we ask You right now that all of us would come before You with pure hearts. That, God, we would come before You right now if there's, if there's any sin that's hindering us from direct fellowship with You right now, then, God, we would set aside those sins, and we would ask You to cleanse us with Your Word as it cleanses us like dross. Lord, would You clear our heart in such a way to where we can hear from You effectively? Lord, would you bring us to a place of humility? Would you bring us to a place of dependency and a need for you? God, I ask you even now that your Holy Spirit would, would empower me and your Holy Spirit would lead me and would lead our church in your word, O oh God, and that you would help us to know you more today. Just as a gigantic ship makes one degree, one turn at a time, so we as people become like Jesus, one degree, one turn at a time. And I ask you, God, that you would continue to do your work upon us. Lord, help us to be the ones who walk in humility. And then we ask you in response, Lord, have your way in us. We ask you in response that we would end up looking like you at the end of the day. God, we ask you that we'd walk in the Spirit. And we ask you that whatever your word has for us today, that, Lord, we would submit to it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to actually turn in your Bibles to begin today with Psalm 139. Go to Psalm 139. I'm thinking of Ruth last week at the end of chapter 3, and I know that she is faced with this dilemma to where she has to wait to see what will happen. Will Boaz be her redeemer, or will the nearest kinsman redeemer be the one who uh, takes that work upon himself? So here's Ruth. She's in a position of waiting, and you know, sometimes in life, faith is an action and that action looks like us walking and talking and doing something with our hands. But other times, faith is actively waiting. And in that sense, faith would be an action where we are called to wait where God has us. We don't know what's next. We don't know what's next in the midst of the crisis or how God will solve our problems. But behold, He's always there. Psalm 139, O Lord, You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my thoughts or my, all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, 
Even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made and secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake... I am still with you. And the basic premise of verses 1 through 18 is that God is always there regardless of where you are. Think of the comfort of the, um, the omnipresence of God. I have to trust that God is present even when I don't see the hand or the face of God. Do you know what this requires of us? Do you know what this also required of Ruth? It required faith. And I, I think we live in such an age where we're all after the facts of what I can see that have been proven from the past. But let us not forget that the Bible calls us to faith because faith before God is what equals righteousness. God will never work with the believer without requiring or necessitating faith. Think about that. You could have all the answers, you could have all the knowledge, but if you don't have faith in God in the moment, you're not pleasing to Him in the circumstance. What God calls us to is an active faith, one that will say, Lord, at the end of the day, I trust in You. And that's what it means to have a relationship with God. Lord, you're right, I'm wrong. Lord, you know what's ahead. Lord, I don't. God, I'm submitting to You. You need to submit to no one. But my faith in God is what makes me right before Him. My faith in God is what pleases Him. And sometimes if you're like Ruth, you don't know what to expect. You don't know what's around the corner. You've gone through all of this faith already. You have risked upon risks to go to the threshing floor at night, to present yourself before Boaz, all for Boaz to say, listen, I will redeem you, but legally there's someone ahead of me. Legally, I, I, can't, I can't in my conscience go around God's word. I can't cut corners the Levitical law doesn't allow me to redeem you just yet. Let's see what happens as we put this before God. Listen, God will never reveal Himself to an extent that abrogates the necessity for growth and maturation and trust in Him. In other words, God will not remove that tension of faith in your life. God will not give you so many answers so as to say, you no longer need to trust me. In fact, He'll give you just enough. And oftentimes He answers last minute. That's the character of our God because He would rather have our trust and our faith than us being comfortable. God is there all the time, in the good times and in the crisis. The question is, can I trust God given these circumstances today? What if a more difficult circumstance arises? Can I trust God even then? We live in a day and age where people are often looking for God in the phenomenological. But we actually find God hidden behind the scenes one step at a time, one moment at a time, revealed in the faithfulness of our character towards Him. Oftentimes we see God answering as we remain faithful to Him. And last week we even discussed this from Anna Paula Mumi's testimony and Sean Mumi's testimony. The act of faith looks like entrusting yourself to God's faithfulness. See, it's one thing to put your faith in God. It's another to believe that He's going to remain faithful towards you and He's going to work all things together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Church family, listen. Your faithfulness in the next second is an investment in the next minute. And your faithfulness in the next minute is an investment in the next hour. And your faithfulness in the next hour is an investment in the next day. And the next day, the next week, the next week, the next month, the next month, the next year, the next year, the next decade, the next lifetime that you have in front of you. Your faithfulness now counts for an eternity. Your faithfulness in Jesus today and trusting yourself to His goodness regardless of the circumstances matters for an eternity. 
Look, when we can't clearly see God, it does not remove our responsibility of being godly. What God requires us today is, do you trust me? Is your faith in me? I want you to think of this. The life of a believer is not always a life of fireworks. We so quickly, within a few minutes, read our Bibles. We turn from one page to the next, forgetting that there were faithful men and women of God in the Scriptures who went for days and weeks and months without hearing from the voice of God. To which I argue here is this. Sometimes the silence of God is more developmental in your life as a Christian than the voice of God is. Not that we don't have the voice of God before us in the Scriptures. I'm not arguing that. I'm talking about the moments where you feel so close to God that you feel deeply and intimately led by Him, circumstance by circumstance. And sometimes what God wants to do in our life is not speak to us so that His silence would cause us to draw even more to His heart. See, God's silence often brings about the spiritual nutrients that we need. The spiritual nutrients that created us trust and endurance and faithfulness and devotion. That word endurance, I've said this before in many sermons, but the word endurance means this. You're willing to stand up under the weight of the pressure, not giving in, not dropping the weight that's on your shoulders. Biblical endurance looks like this. When God is silent... You live in such a way where you say, Jesus, I will hold on. In fact, I will trust that you're holding on to me. The silence of God is developing in the life of the believer. So if you're someone here today who's waiting on God, you're someone here today who, you know, we say these cliches often, I just haven't heard from God in a while. What if that's his plan to set you apart? What if that's his plan to develop you deeper into the image of Jesus Christ? What if His plan for your life is to look like Him, for Him to sanctify you and to purify you, and He's going to do it through His silence? And by the way, if you have a true, genuine, intimate, deep relationship with God, the silence of God will be apparent to you because you will have heard from Him before. Think about it, church family. If the silence of God drives you crazy, that's a good thing. Because it means you have heard His voice before. You have heard from Him. You do know Him. If you don't know Him, then you don't know that He's been silent to begin with. Because your relationship with Him has continued to remain separated. But if the silence of God creates in you this desire to draw near to His heart, listen, He's bringing out the best of you, so stay encouraged. Keep walking with Jesus, even if He's quiet. You've heard the old story that in the most difficult times in life, you're looking on the seashore, you're looking on the shore near the beach, and you see one set of footprints in the most difficult times of life. And Jesus says, yeah, that's where I was carrying you the whole time. Church family, let me encourage you here. Jesus is with you, and if you're a believer and you have a relationship with Him, right now, whether He's speaking to you and leading you intimately and directly, and you know where He's leading you, or He's silent to you. He's doing something in your life and He is continuing to sanctify Himself as Lord in your heart. We must trust Him as Lord and King whether He speaks or not. See, when I can't see the victory, God already sees it because God's already at the finish line of my life. We often aim for being great. We often aim for being excellent. We often aim at being gifted. But listen, the number one thing God cares about most is your faithfulness as a believer. He cares about your faithfulness as a believer. He cares about you being a good soldier. He cares about you living a life of active faith and trust in Him. You know the story of Abraham in Genesis chapters 12 through 24. We know that Abraham is known as the father of faith, but do you know that the word faith is only used twice in all of those 12 chapters? And oftentimes we see years and even decades of silence in Abraham's life. And yet he's known as the father of faith. He wrestled and he clawed and he scrapped. But his faith was evident. And when it really came down to it, 
he trusted God even with his very own son, and he trusted that God would resurrect his son from the dead if needed. See, Abraham was the first one to trust in the resurrection of the dead. Church family, Ruth, found in chapter 3, she is evincing, she is displaying a life of faith before us. And that's why I felt this invitation to go back to chapter 3 this week, not to end it too quickly. Your faith now matters for an eternity. Let's pick it up in chapter 4 of Ruth. Ruth chapter 4. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, friend. Sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and he said, sit down here. So they sat down. First of all, they're meeting here at the city gate. This was a marketplace. This was a place of gossip. This was also a place of judicial hearings. Ten men, ten trustworthy elders gather around because Boaz says, hey, there are some legal proceedings that need to take place. Myself and the closest relative, we need to meet and we need eyewitnesses. We have no form of paper or copy machines or fax or internet. Therefore, we're relying upon eyewitness accounts. He says to this unnamed relative in verse 3, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother, or really it's the word relative, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our relative Elimelech. Some would say that maybe this was a, a cousin of Elimelech, maybe a brother, literal brother of Elimelech, maybe a nephew, something of that sort. Nevertheless, at the end of the day, there's a piece of land that belongs to our brother Elimelech who has passed away in the land of Moab. We need to do something about this. Verse 4, So I thought to inform you, Boaz says, saying, Buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it. And I am after you. And lo and behold, look what the man says. Who would not entertain wanting more land? He says, yeah, sure, I'll redeem it. No problem. What's the big deal? Verse 5, then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to, for this reason, raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. In other words, you're not just going to get the land, you're going to get Ruth, the wife of Malon, the one who is still technically a part of the, the property, or maybe not property, but the land and the ownings or the belongings of Elimelech. You're going to get Ruth too. Now, church family, pause for a brief second. What do we know about Ruth? And what do we, what do we know about what the town knows about Ruth? Turn backwards for a brief moment. Go to chapter 3, verse 11. I want you to see something. After Ruth had essentially proposed to Boaz, this is what Boaz says in chapter 3, verse 11. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city, or you could say all my people in the gate, know that you are a woman of excellence. So what did Boaz just propose to this unnamed relative? Well, he said, you're going to get land from Naomi that's needing redemption. You have the power to do so. Oh, and by the way, you have to also acquire a woman of excellence, a godly woman who the whole town is talking about. But look at verse 6. The closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You have my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. What kind of punk or what type of coward would not want to redeem Ruth at this particular point in the story? Church family, there's a reason why the Bible doesn't mention this individual's name. In seeking to establish, in seeking to preserve his own name, he lost it. 
Doesn't the Bible say that when we seek to save our own life, we will actually lose it? I want you to think of the foil of the characters here. First of all, early on in the book of Ruth, we found that you have Orpah who turns the back, and then you have Ruth, the ultimate one who's faithful. Then you have Boaz, who's this man of God, this, this man of excellence, this man of valor. And then you have this guy who, because of his lack of character, his name isn't even worth mentioning in the Bible. There's a Hebrew word for this called Poloni Almoni, or I just call him Baloney. Because at the end of the day, he could care less about the things of God. What was he being asked to do? He was being asked to raise up a deceased family member's line to continue. And ultimately, if, if he would have known, he would have known that he was being asked to protect the line of the Messiah. He had to care for the physical things of life, but he didn't care about Abraham's seed, which br would bring about the Savior of the world. I want you to think about this for a second. Imagine if you're the Portland Trailblazers in 1983 and you have the second pick in the NBA draft and you knew, you knew what would become of Michael Jordan's career. You probably would not have drafted Sam Bowie. You probably would not have allowed the Chicago Bulls to select him with pick number three. You probably would have said, oh man, if I knew what I would have been rejecting, I would have never drafted Sam Bowie. I would have gone with Michael Jordan. The same is here. Imagine this individual. You just forfeited the ability to raise up the name of a deceased relative to preserve the line of the Messiah, the one who would save the world. You missed out, bro. And it's all because of your selfishness. This brings me to another point because names in the book of Ruth hold a theological significance. Again, let's think about Ruth. Her name means loyalty, and she's shown that all the way through. Names in the Bible were often given, you, you actually possess multiple names, but they were often given as an attribute of your character, or in hopes of what the parents wanted for you, or it was given by an angel from heaven. And we think about the name Orpah, whose name means turning of the back, and the name Boaz, whose name means in one whom we can find strength. And we know that one of the pillars of the temple was named after Boaz because you can count on him. But here's this unnamed relative. It makes me think of Proverbs 22 verse 1. A good name is to be desired more than wealth. Or Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus says, You can do a bunch of great things for me in ministry, but there may come a day where I say, I never personally knew you. Or what about Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, when it speaks about the overcomer who will receive a new name? Or what about Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, that speaks about how the overcomer will not have his name erased from the book of life, but instead will confess his name before my Father and his angels in heaven? Or what about Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, which speaks about how the overcomer will have written on him a new name of my God and the city of my God? And finally, if you have in your Bibles, Revelation chapter 20. You should have the book of Revelation in your Bible, otherwise it's heresy. But turn to Revelation chapter 20 and go to verse 11. Revelation chapter 20 verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, the other books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Look at verse 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Earlier in the year, I collected anecdotes, excuse me, anecdotes from those in the church family. And one of them really stuck out to me, and it's from our, one of our very own youth, Nathan Rhodes. He wrote this back in November. Many people say that there are dangers in the woods. 
cities and even in your house. But I think that the most dangerous thing is sin. Sin is anything we think, say, or do that displeases God. Everybody has sinned. I'll say that again. Everybody has sinned. Most people say, oh, I didn't take that, or it was a little white lie. There is no such thing as a little white lie. It is just a lie that makes God sad. Amen? If you're not a Christian, and you want to become one, you just need to say, dear Jesus, Thank you for dying on the cross for me and for my sins. Thank you for coming back to life three days later. I'm sorry I've sinned. Please forgive me. It is that simple. But if you do not want to be a Christian, you are going to go to a real place called hell. And you will spend eternal life in that hot, burning, fiery place in which you wish you were a Christian in heaven. Heaven is a place where Christians spend eternal life forever and ever. By the way, with the God who He Himself is eternal. Jesus is waiting for you to become a child of God. Nathan Rhodes, thank you so much for your godliness and your love for Jesus. Turning back to Ruth chapter 4, this unnamed individual gives over everything because he himself wanted to protect his own name only to lose it. Look in verse 7. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. In other words, he got out his credit card and this was the attestation. This was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. And he removed his sandal. In other words, buy it for yourself. Invest in the line of the Messiah for yourself. And he removed his sandal. Verse 9, then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Malon. Moreover, Boaz said, I have acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. Verse 11, all the people who were in the court and the elders said, You are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home. Actually, let's back up. May the Lord, may the great I am, may the eternal one, may the covenant keeping God who keeps his promises, may that God make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, matriarchs in Israel, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah. El Ephrathah, by the way, means wealth. May you achieve wealth in wealth and become famous in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Verse 12, Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. If there's one thing that drives the rest of this passage today, it's that of redemption. What is redemption? If you're listening on air, if you're listening from the church parking lot, Jesus wants to give you redemption if you don't know Him as Lord and Savior yet. Redemption means to repurchase. It means to deliver. And if you are a redeemer, it means one who buys back. The first time we see the word redeem is in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, as God rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt. It says, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm. In other words, I will intervene with my strength and with great judgments upon those who oppress you. Just as sin oppresses a person today, so God will reach down in the person of Jesus Christ, in the humility of Jesus Christ, and He will buy you back for Himself and give you a new life, a new purpose. Exodus 15 verse 13 tells us that 
In God's loving kindness, He has led the people whom He has redeemed. He has guided them to His holy habitation. Luke 21, 28 tells us to lift our heads for our redemption is nigh. Romans 3 tells us that we are justified as a gift of His grace, redemption by His blood. And Hebrews 9 tells us that our redemption is eternal. If you trust in Jesus today, He will save you from your past and give you a future and begin a new love relationship with Him. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. Redeem your people and lead us onward for tomorrow counts for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.